What plane, if any, won the war? A list like that might feature a B-17, a P-51, an IL-2 or even a Spitfire. I'll propose another candidate, an unlikely one for sure, but considering its importance of providing a steady flow of well-trained pilots, its impact cannot be understated. The Texan. Hello everybody and welcome back to Military Aviation History. Today we are in Lausanne, Switzerland having a look at a T-6 Texan, an American World War II trainer aircraft. Today's example is maintained in flightworthy condition here in Switzerland by its owner and he is actually offering passenger flights on this particular aircraft. The T-6 had a spectacular production run of over 15,000 aircraft produced during the war. That is more than most American planes. Let's have a closer look. In the mid-1930s, the North American Aviation Company entered the market with their NA-16, the first trainer aircraft that they developed. Looking actually remarkably similar to the plane behind me, the NA-16 was a single-engine low-wing monoplane with tandem seating, meaning the crew would sit in a row rather than next to each other. This was very much the uh, status quo at the time. What made it somewhat special was the enclosed cockpit unless you wanted an open one which was a possibility and of course the aforementioned monoplane design the shift to such designs was a relatively recent one in comparison most contemporaries and most companies had trainers still as a biplane design introduced in 1945 the na-16 proliferated in the united states army air corps although it was redesignated as the bt-9 or na-19 in company lingo about 300 were accepted into service by america the aircraft also saw some success on the export market notably being exported to the commonwealth where it was rechristened as tends to happen when you export into that part of the world into the harvard one after a 1938 commission tour the united states on the look for a new trainer aircraft by this time north american had already incrementally updated the design initially the aircraft featured a tubular steel construction with a fabric covering while later it opted to go with a metal alloy covering as you can see here. The wings were modified for better stall characteristics, the rudder was changed from a very rounded to a translangular design and the once fixed landing gear was made retractable. The cockpit canopy was also redesigned and a proper radio was added. These changes had opened up the road to the NA-26, which was submitted for consideration in 37. After a short production as BC-1s, the aircraft was designated 86 Advanced Trainer 6 or the Harvard 2. This again was a success seeing use in America and abroad, most notably as part of the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan in Canada. Uh, Britain eventually received around 1,200 Harvard twos between July 41 and May 42. By now, the AT-6, or the SNJ if you are a Navy man, had become the principal trainer in America. Powered by the Pratt & Whitney R1340 Wasp radial engine, modifications to the aircraft continue to provide the Air Force with a flexible training tool. For example, the AT-6B featured a central-mounted single 30 cal machine gun for gunnery practice. This is the reason why so many different versions exist of the aircraft, each with up to three or even four different designations, depending on who actually used them. And we certainly can't go through all of them today. All in all, over 15,000 AT-6s were produced between 1940 and 45. And if we add the previous production runs together, we get a figure closer to 17,000. The number of aircrews training on this aircraft on the Allied side is impossible to judge, but it became one of the main trainer aircraft of the war. 
Post-war, its service was continued. So widely has it indeed proliferated that nowadays you'll find one in most aircraft museums around the globe and then some. The story does not end here, however, as the AT-6 was also used in combat. By proxy, the NA-16 saw service as the Australian CAC Wearaway, while the AT-6 itself was used in light bombing roles in more than just one instance. They provided close air support in the Arab-Israeli war in 1940 on both sides, were used in Korea for reconnaissance and forward air control, and were also used in various conflicts within the old European colonies, notably for example French Algeria, and then also over in South America. Due to arms embargoes, the plane also stayed in service in South Africa until the mid-90s. The aircraft was flexible enough to go full Texan, allowing the installation of machine gun pods, rockets or bombs, and its loiter time, good visibility, and ability to provide form from most airfields made it a good choice in low intensity and counterinsurgency conflicts. Sometimes the rear section, uh, the actual instructor seat on the trainer was completely changed with a defensive gun installed uh, for the second crew member. Uh, indeed throughout this time, uh, whether as a trainer or a reimagined ground support vehicle. The 86 gained a stellar reputation with its crews, whom complemented the plane's flight characteristics, its stability in flight, and ease of handling. In these combat operations, it also gained a reputation of resilience and reliability. The AT-6 presents itself as a modestly sized package with a length of 8.8, .8, a span of 12.8 and a height of 3.6 meters. It's powered by this nine-cylinder air-cooled Pratt & Whitney R4340, giving it a solid 600 horsepower. This allowed it to gain a top speed of around 330 kilometers an hour and endurance was set at a maximum of 1 hour 45 minutes with a range of up to 425 kilometers. Empty weight was just under 2 tons, which went up to 2.5 tons for its loaded weight. Okay, so finding ourselves in the Texan, we are greeted with a very clean instrument board and with ready access to all the controls. Obviously, as a trainer aircraft, this is incredibly important and it's done really, really well in this aircraft. What we have up front are all the instruments that you need for flight. To your left, you have your engine controls, you have the trim tabs, the, the fuel tanks, the flaps and all that good stuff, the landing gear as well. And to your right, you have some of the electrical systems and the fuses. Uh, be behind the stick, just behind the stick, you have the radio, which is of course a modern one right now. The front position that I'm sitting in here is, it tends to be occupied by the student with the instructor in the back. Going through the instrument board, you can see, as, as I said, a very clean selection of instruments. We have the variometer up top, followed by a compass, an artificial horizon. Uh, just below that, we've got the airspeed, we've got the altitude, we've got the turn and slip, we've got uh, the uh, manifold pressure, the RPMs. Below that, starting again on the left, you have your G unit meter, you've got a clock, you've got your oil temperature, you've got your oil pressure and your fuel pressure, and of course your cylinder head temperature, this being an air-cooled engine. We've got the landing lights and also the indication lights whether the landing gear is down and locked or up. Moving over a little bit further to the left, you've got your throttle control, you've got your mixture control, and then below that, uh, directly below that, you've got the carburetor, air intake control, and then we also have far out so it doesn't get accidentally used the emergency re release for the gear. Moving up a little bit closer to the pilot, we've got the trim tabs for the rudder and the elevator, as well as the fuel pump uh, set between those, and we have the landing gear uh, handle. Uh, behind that, you have very easy access to the fuel tank selector, uh, one in each side, of course, uh, 52 gallons left and right, and you've got the flap release. And it's got a few nice little features, something you don't see that often, of course, set between the rudder pedals, you actually have a starter pedal that you would use on startup, more on that later. What is also cool with the uh, control stick is that it is lockable and unlockable. To, uh, to unlock unlock it, you essentially just have to release a little catch, you see that below, and you've got control over the control surface just like this. The stick is a very simple one, no fuss here. To lock it again, you just lean down, you push it up, and you lock it in place. 
Uh, we've got a little bit of a hand rest here as well if you want, if you need it. And um, there's very little you could say uh, about this aircraft that uh, would be negative. A little bit of a mirror here, good all around visibility, everything's fine. I'm obviously sitting up front where the student would be sitting, the instructor would usually be behind. There we go, easy. All right, so starting up an AT6 Texan. This is something a student would have to do on a very regular basis every time he flies out. Uh, relatively simple procedure. To your right, you flick on the batteries. To your left, you select the left fuel tank. Uh, then you set your carburation intake to cold. You open up the throttle just slightly. You set the mixture to rich. You open up the primer behind the stick. You start pumping fuel on your left. You close the primer. You open it up again. You start pumping once again. You close that up. You do this roughly six times. At this point, you should be seeing the fuel pressure uh, to have risen and at that point you engage the uh, starter pedal which is set between your two rudder pedals and once you saw four blades you select the magnetos to both at this point you'll have to look also at the oil pressure and once you see for uh, roughly 40 uh, pounds per square inch you uh, push up on the rpms you also release the starter pedal and you'll see the engine firing once it has fired and once it's uh, running smoothly you'll also check the uh, rpms that it stays around about a thousand rpms just for warm up and there we go this is pretty much how you start up uh, an at6 texan so since we've been mainly looking at the front seat, let's have a quick look in the back and I'll point out some minor differences. First off, the instruments up front are pretty much mirrored here. You have your basic six and the engine instrument gauges and a flight stick and some good leg room. The flight stick can be disconnected and stowed to the left of the occupant where it is locked in place. Now the connector sits between your legs as you would expect, of course. Now, in order for the occupant of the rear seat to connect himself to the aircraft's control surfaces, you can unlatch a spring-loaded catch and pull on the stick in its stowed position. Then you insert it into the connector. To remove it and uh, place it back, you follow the same procedure. It really is just that simple. To your left, the engine control quadrant looks the same as in front. For emergencies, a fire extinguisher is available. Neat feature here. You see it on some other planes as well. It can be accessed from the inside or because it's stored in a hinged door also from the outside. Some of you might also have noticed that the aircraft features a colorful mix of a paint scheme, which I hadn't realized until I arrived and it turned out to be quite a surprise. Up front it looks a little bit like an army plane, although most will probably link Felix the Cat there to the Navy. But it's been used more widely than that. The back is very US Navy, of course, including the Navy designation of the Texan, that being SNJ, while the wheels feature pre May 1942 Army Air Force insignias. The current owner bought the aircraft as you see it here and is looking into getting a more unified paint scheme, although these things simply take time. The Texan might not look like much compared to one of those popular warbirds from World War II, yet its service and design ensured that pilots were given exactly the training they needed before heading into combat. In doing so, it might very well have contributed more as an aircraft than quite a number of other machines. And unlike many of its contemporaries, the AT-6 continued to serve in silence far beyond 1945, providing one generation of pilots after the other with the fundamentals, even after jets were introduced. Today you'll find them everywhere, on air shows, in museums and as monuments. And when you see one, instead of walking by it, as we do so many times, when we see another more shiny warbird just around the corner, take a second and have a look at this one. It deserves it, and that's a promise. Thank you very much for watching, and I want to thank the owner of this particular aircraft for allowing us to get close uh, here in Lausanne with his aircraft. He does offer this aircraft with hired passenger flights, so if you find yourself in the area, do check it out. All the details are in the description. And if you enjoyed this content, please also consider supporting future videos via Patreon or PayPal. This does help me produce this kind of content. And please also remember to share this video. As always, have a great day, good hunting, and see you in the sky.